Hi everyone, my name is Corey and I'm here at the Akron Zoo. Um, so today we are talking about one of my favorite animals, often under misunderstood, uh, we're talking about bats. Um, so we're here in our Mesoamerica building, so three different species of bats that live in here. So we have our straw colored fruit bats, our Rodriguez bats, and our Siva short tail bats. Um, so the ones right over here, uh, we have the Rodriguez and the straw colored fruit bats. Um, so these two bats are some of the larger fruit bats. Uh, the straw-colored fruit bats live in Africa, uh, different parts of Africa, and then the Rodriguez bats can be found. Um, little tiny island. Yeah, a little tiny island right off of Madagascar, so a really, really tiny island on the Rodriguez can be found. Um, so when you look at these bats, um, you'll notice they have some differences to the bats that we have in Ohio. Um, so these bats have much larger eyes, um, so the fruit bats don't need to use echolocation um, when they're looking for their fruit, um, because fruit, unlike insects, is pretty stationary. It doesn't move around on the trees. Um, so they have those large eyes to help them see really well. They have big ears, they can hear really well, and they have those noses to smell their fruit. Um, so they can get lots of different types of fruit here at the zoo. Um, so they get cantaloupe and melon, bananas, apples, grapes, all that good stuff. They get some veggies, so occasionally have corn, um, different types of lettuce, uh, broccoli, all that good stuff. Um, so some other differences between Ohio bats. So uh, Ohio bats are much smaller. Um, like I mentioned, Ohio bats do use echolocation, um, using to find the insects. Uh, why well, I said misunderstood. So a lot of times people are scared of bats, which I it's understandable, uh, but Ohio bats are really important to have around. Uh, so I always ask the question, who likes mosquitoes? And most of the time, no one really says yes. So even myself, I'm not a huge fan of mosquitoes, right? Uh, but one Ohio bat, just in a single night, they can eat up to like a thousand mosquitoes in an hour, which is phenomenal. So just one bat can do that in an hour. So you imagine a whole colony of bats in a certain area eating hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes nightly. Um, so you may have noticed that it seems like, at least in my experience, I've seen to notice more and more mosquitoes as the years go on. Uh, that is because the number of bats, unfortunately, is declining. Um, so there is something called a white nose syndrome, which is something a lot of local bats across the, and across the country actually are suffering from. So it's a, a fungus um, that affects them so they can't fully hibernate like they would need to in the winter. Um, so they're dying uh, from that fungus. And it's something that humans actually, we can transport, it doesn't affect us, but when we go into like a cave area, it's something that can actually be transmitted on our shoes. So when you step in it and then you go somewhere else, you're moving that fungus from the next place to another. Um, so that's something they're really trying to work on to help the bats in Ohio, Indiana, all around, all around this country. Um, but yeah, these fruit bats are um, pretty cool. Um, so we have these large ones. Um, and then we also have a different type of fruit bat too. Um, we have the Siva short tail fruit bats. Um, so those are on the other side of our habitat here. Uh, so much smaller guys, uh, but still the same kind of thing. So they're really good. Um, really good for pollinating too. So we didn't mention that. So they do like fruits, uh, but they also like flowers. Uh, so some of these little short tail bats uh, really are great for pollinating. So when they're eating the fruit, they get a pollen and they go from flower to flower, from tree to tree. Um, they're transmitting that with that pollen. Um, so phenomenal pollinators on um, different parts of the country and the world. Uh, so the Siva short tail are being found in South America. Um, so they're being found in the rainforest of South America. Uh, and most of these bats, uh, when they have their, their pups, they have about uh, one pup uh, per litter. Um, sometimes maybe two, but most of the time just one. And bats are mammals, right? So they're the only flying mammal, which is a, a pretty cool pretty cool thing. And then their, their wings are actually kind of serve as, as their hands. So you kind of imagine when their bats spread out their wings, uh, that is actually like their hands. So when they're flapping their wings, it's like they're kind of flapping their jazz hands at you when they're flying around. Well, we have a, a hundreds of the, the, the Siva short tail you're seeing now, um, and then in the dozens of the, of the larger uh, fruit bats across the way. So does the light hurt the bat's eyes? That is a good question. Uh, so I didn't mention that yet. So most of these fruit bats are actually something called um, crepuscular. Uh, so what that means is that they're most active in dusk and dawn. Um, so they don't really have the, the short, the small eyes like our high bats do. So they see pretty well, their eyes work pretty similar to ours. Um, so yeah, they're more active in dusk and dawn. 
Um, and then when you're here at the zoo, um, we kind of actually flip, flip the cycle. So when you're here, it's daytime at the zoo. Um, we make it a little bit darker in here, um, just so it is more where they would be active. So you can see them moving around, flying, uh, eating, and then uh, at nighttime, when it's dark outside, no one's at the zoo, um, it actually gets a little bit brighter in here. So that way they can actually take their nap, get the rest in when no one is here. Do bats mate for life? No, so not typically. So typically they'll, they'll mate and then kind of move on um, to their, their next friends down the line. Uh, but yeah, bats can be found, these bats especially can be found in giant colonies. So the sevas you're looking at can be anywhere from 10 to 100s, and then some of the other larger can be you know, in the thousands of giant colonies together. And actually one of the largest bat colonies in the world is actually found in Texas, where there's like hundreds of thousands living in a cave, so it's pretty cool once a year. Near Austin, they all kind of fly out together in giant flocks, but that is actually one of the largest bat colonies in the whole world. So how do bats go to the bathroom? All right, that is actually kind of a fun question. So when you see bats, right, they're mostly hanging upside down, or how we would see them as upside down. But when they go to the bathroom, a lot of times, especially if they're, if they're when they're flying, they may just go about the fly, but if they're just hanging there, they actually sometimes will flip right side up. So actually kind of flip upside down for them, right side up for us, then they go to the bathroom. Otherwise, if they're going to the bathroom when they're hanging, like they hang, they actually will go to the bathroom all over themselves which isn't too smart. Because bats are typically pretty clean, clean animals. They do like to spend a lot of time grooming themselves. So do bats offspring stay in the same colony or do they move on? Yeah, I would, yeah typically, yeah, I imagine they, they typically stay within the same colony. So kind of building up their numbers. So what do the uh, Siba bats eat? So mostly fruit. So yeah, these are mostly fruit eaters. So they'll get different times of year, they may get different things, um, but they'll like the cantaloupe, honeydew, apples, banana grapes, all that good stuff. And they'll also get their veggies too. So they'll like broccoli and corn. And then sometimes the stevas will get insects, uh, but mostly fruit. Whereas the, the bats, we're seeing the Rodriguez and the straw color, are pretty much primarily only fruit. So what's a good way to attract bats to a bat house? Um, so it kind of depends on the area you're in. So the more kind of wooded areas, more protected areas, less in like big open cities. Um, so there's really no way to attract them per se, uh, but having a bat box, I mean, it's always a great thing to do to help encourage them in our areas. Um, anytime I see bats in my yard, I get super excited. I completely nerd out because I'm like, yes, you're eating mosquitoes. So when you see them swooping around, they're eating all those bugs that we don't want in our yards. Um, so yeah, very, very beneficial animals to have. What is the average life expectancy for each type of bat? Um, so usually about like 15, 15 years. Um, so the Siva short tail are a little less. Um, so about nine years um, in their natural habitat, we can say about uh, about to 19 in human care, so in zoos. Uh, the straw color fruit bats are about yeah, 15 in the natural habitat, about 20 or so um, in human care at zoos. And then Rodriguez um, are even longer. Um, so they can live up to about 28 in human care zoos. Do we do any enrichment for the bats? We do. Um, so a lot of for bats, especially these um, guys you're looking at, a lot of it is just physical enrichment. So rearranging their their, um, their home here, their habitat. Um, so you'd be moving around branches, adding different textures and stuff to grab on. You see they have a lot of natural perching, so a lot of branches that we have here at the zoo. So different, a lot of different shrubs and stuff you see around the zoo. A lot of that is planted in mind that once we can cut it down, it's safe to put in the habitat uh, for the bats to use. Um, it can be, you know, putting, instead of maybe cutting up their fruit, you could be putting a full fruit in there. So putting a full banana or a full apple. Um, so I guess them actually having to work to get into that fruit. Um, so different stuff like that. Um, even the people that come in and out here, um, it's good enrichment for them too. Um, so getting to see different stuff, um, different sounds, different smells. Do the bats miss? our guests and visitors? Um, I, yeah, so it's definitely definitely a change of pace. Um, so the bats are, they can be, they're a very social species amongst themselves. Um, so I'm sure at times, um, just having people around is a good enrichment. So I'm sure they're, sure they're excited to have welcome people back here at the zoo when we're able to open up again. Definitely, some of the bats are very interested in us right now. They keep staring at us. And then I can actually pass it to 
Speaking of bats that are social and enjoy seeing people, I can pass it to my friend Carrie, who's going to introduce you to two of our education group bats. Hi everybody, my name is Carrie and I work in the education department and I'm actually the primary trainer for our two straw colored bats in our education department. Now you may notice I do have a mask on since I am working a little bit closer with the girls here and the mask is actually for their protection because I am out and about in the world and could potentially pick up all kinds of bugs and germs and stuff and could potentially pass it on to them. So whenever we work closely with the bats, we do have to wear a mask. We have a few species here at the zoo that we're doing that with, and our tigers, our uh, weasel family, so our otters, our skunks, our ferrets, things like that, we're actually wearing, taking a little bit of extra precaution and wearing masks with. So it's actually for their protection and not for my protection, believe it or not. So these two here are Sierra and Leon. So they do come from Africa. They're the same as the straw colored bats that Corey just talked about in the habitat. And they do come from Sierra Leone, Africa, so their names make sense. But the one here in the front is Leone. <laughs> She's kind of checking things out. And then the one taking a little bit of a snack on her broccoli, that is Sierra. So these two originally were born here at the zoo. And they were born in the big habitat where the rest of the straw colored bats live and everything. Unfortunately though, Sierra was born with something that a lot of humans are familiar with. She was born with scoliosis. So you can kind of see, she's not super well lit there, but she's a little bit shorter and squattier than Leon is, and that's because her spine curves, just like a human with scoliosis. And what that meant for her was that Sierra really can't fly, and sometimes she loses her grip and falls when she's just kind of hanging around. So if you notice in her little kennel here, this is her travel kennel, we have it nice and padded on the bottom, so if Sierra falls, she hits the towel, she's padded, she can just army crawl across the bottom and climb back up the side. When she lived in the big habitat with the other bats, that didn't work as well, and she was hurting herself. So they ended up having to pull Sierra to come live in a smaller house so that could be padded and completely like meshed in so that she can climb if she does fall. Well, as Corey was saying, bats are very social, so she needed a friend. And um, after we looked at some of the different bats that we had living here at the zoo, it was discovered that Leon knows how to fly, but her mom never actually taught her how to land. So uh, Leon was actually crash landing in the habitat and also injuring herself. So it was decided that these two kind of misfits would make a good pair to come down and live with us in education. And they get along super duper well. They're like sisters or best friends. While Corey was talking, they were actually stealing a piece of hair in and out of each other's mouth, which is pretty common for them to do. Um, now Leon, I don't know if you guys have followed some of our other Facebook stuff over the past years, but if you remember the bat that had the nail fungus that was getting her nails painted once a week, that's Leon because over the years she actually developed a nail fungus just like what people can get and she had to have it treated and her treatment was to paint each nail with this medicine and then coat it with um, nail polish to keep the medicine on nice and you know strong for the whole week so it would treat for the whole entire week. Leon thankfully has actually successfully exited that treatment so her nails are doing pretty well and she doesn't have to go down once a week for her spot treatment anymore. I think she's still got a little residual nail polish on, but we have stopped treating it because her nails are growing in nice and healthy and strong, so we're very excited about that. But like I said, these two get along super duper well, and they're really cool to use for education. I enjoyed taking them out and talking about them. They're actually really smart, believe it or not. So Corey was talking about you know, how well they live together in colonies and how social they are, but they're actually really smart animals too. So one of the things that they'll do that's kind of neat, these two are trained in their house when Corey and I walk up to the front of it. They come up to the front, they each have their own spots where they, they kind of hang. <laughs> Leon's checking the camera out a little bit. But they'll come up to their sp certain spots, they'll hang there, they'll wait to get re reinforced or rewarded for coming to their station spots. And then when it's time to take them out of their house, Sierra is trained to climb out onto a special padded perch that she can really grip a hold of well. And Leon is trained to climb out onto like a 
gardening glove for roses. It kind of comes up to my elbow, so she'll climb out of that glove and hang from it. And then we can transport them in and out of their kennel so we can take them out and introduce them to people. Now, I know a question we're going to get a lot of has to do with bats and the coronavirus. <laughs> um, they have gotten a bad reputation with that. So during my research, when I was looking into it, bats do carry the coronavirus. They carry different forms of the coronavirus. There's all kinds of different kinds of the coronavirus. SARS is related to it. The coronavirus, this one is coronavirus COVID-19 because it came out in 2019. But there's all kinds of different numbers after that saying that it's come out in different forms throughout the years. Well, bats have carried the coronavirus in their bodies for thousands of years. They, for whatever reason, the, the virus and the bat's immune system have adapted to coexist. So they don't get really sick even though they're carrying it because their body's immune system keeps it down to levels where it doesn't get them sick. So the problem actually comes when people come into the picture. So what happened in the case probably with COVID-19 and the bats is that people go out into the wild and they will actually hunt and kill straw colored bats and other, particularly the fruit eating bats because they're bigger bats, and then they will eat them and they may not cook them well enough. And what happened was people were hunting and killing the bats and they were eating them, not cooking them well enough, and that allowed that disease to kind of mutate and transform in the bodies of the humans into something that we could catch. So the real problem isn't necessarily the bats, it's the idea of wildlife trade or even the wet markets that you find all around the world. So a wet market is a market where you go and there's just tables piled of all different kinds of meats, fish, in some countries it can be bats, sometimes it can be tarantulas, all kinds of crazy stuff in big wet piles, sort of on ice. Well, that turns into kind of a breeding ground for all different diseases. And unfortunately, that's where COVID-19 came from. They think it got bred in that kind of wet market and then people were eating the bats that weren't refrigerated well enough or cooked well enough, and then that transferred into humans. So I have no fear of our bats here at the zoo ever giving me anything like that. Um, I'm not planning on eating them. So <laughs> um, wildlife trade is another issue that needs to be mentioned and brought to the forefront too when we're talking about diseases because unfortunately it's not just the coronavirus or COVID-19. It's been several of our last few major diseases and pandemics that have gone around the world have come from trading in wildlife, whether it's live animals or their pieces and parts, or from those wet markets. So that's more of what people need to address than worrying about the individual animals coming in and you know, giving you COVID or something like that. So hopefully that kind of answers your questions. It's a very complex situation, but I try to you know, give you a little bit more information about it. But these two are two of my favorite animals to work with here at the zoo. They are very smart. Um, they're also really important, as Corey mentioned. Bats are pollinators. So these guys love to eat sweet stuff. So they eat fruits, and mostly fruits. The sweeter the fruit, the better. So banana and grapes are their favorites. They were fighting over some pear. They like apple. But in the wild, they will also drink the nectar out of flowers. And when they stick their face down in the flowers to drink the nectar, they get pollen all over their face, and then they go from flower to flower, and they pollinate. But that's not all they do, because when they eat the fruits, they're not picky. They're not like us. They don't pick the seeds out. So they actually will swallow some of the seeds, and then as they're flying looking for more fruits, they go to the bathroom, and they disperse seeds with natural fertilizer already around them. So they do help a lot of our plants to grow. I know here in the United States, even our bats we do a lot of pollination, pollination. So in the case of things like agave, which for the adults out there, that turns into te to tequila. So if it wasn't for bats, we wouldn't have agave or tequila, as well as several of our other fruits and vegetables. Um, I forget how many thousands or millions of dollars farmers would actually lose in the United States because their plants wouldn't grow if it wasn't for bats pollinating them. So they're very, very important 
to our ecosystems. All right, so we've got a lot of questions about right. bats. So what does their fur feel like? Um, they're actually very, very soft. So when Liam goes down, used to go down for her nail treatments, she did have to be kind of anesthetized a little bit, so I was able to feel her then. And But they're very, very soft. Their, their wings actually feel like a balloon. They're very stretchy and rubbery, but their fur is soft. Do we have any bat babies in our colonies? Um, I know we don't have any of the big bats in babies, but our, our smaller bats, they do breed. So there's probably some babies in there. And the, it's kind of cool when bats have babies, the babies actually attach underneath the mother's wing and just holds on and she flies all over the place with the baby still attached. Now it's easy for you guys to tell Sierra and Leon apart, <laughs> but how would we tell any of the bats apart in our colonies? So if you look really close at Sierra, you can see she's got little bands on her thumbs because as Corey was saying, bat wings are like our hands. So those are her thumbs actually sticking up. And you can see she's got little bands. All of our big bats have bands like that on them so the keepers can identify which bat is which. Sierra has worn one of them off over the years. You can see she's got only one on one side and two on the other. Leon doesn't like her, so she picked hers off. <laughs> but they're also microchips like your dogs and cats are too. So they have little microchips in their back. So when the girls are under for their yearly exam, they scan them just to make sure that the chips are still in there and readable and everything. What are the bats natural predators? So for these guys, they're gonna be on the lookout a lot of times for birds of prey, things like hawks, owls, um, maybe even snakes, depending on where the bats live. Um, and unfortunately for straw bats, one of their biggest predators is humans, like I was talking about. Why do some bats seem to guard the food? <laughs> so if you're talking about these two, <laughs> they, they, uh, Sierra does like to guard the food a little bit. Sometimes Leon does. I think it just depends on if it's their favorite or if they're hungry or not. Um, but in a colony, like in our uh, big bat habitat, there does tend to be a, more of a hierarchy. So like the kind of top of the top of the hierarchy gets better food or first choice at the food. So I know our keepers make sure our bats get lots of extra food just to make sure that everybody gets fed. But with these two, if they just kind of protect their particular favorites, they're really going to town on broccoli, which I'm impressed by, because broccoli is not typically one of their favorites, but apparently they're hungry today. So who is the most expensive animal to feed here at the Akron Zoo? Uh, it is our bats, believe it or not. I've seen how much fruit is chopped up for those bats every single day. They fill five gallon buckets full of fresh fruit. Now during the summer, that's awesome. But if you can imagine during the winter trying to get all of that fresh fruit in. So they are the most expensive animals to feed here at the zoo. The penguins come in a close second. <laughs> so what do you give Sierra and Leon as a reward when they come to you? So they, we reward them with their food. So their regular food is like a mush with pieces of fruit chopped up really small in it and then soaked in fruit juice. And then we pull big pieces of fruit out as their big reward. So Sierra's favorite is bananas, and she likes them a little bit riper than what we like them typically. And so that's her biggest reward. She'll also work for apples and potentially grapes. Leon's favorite is grapes. <laughs> she likes her purple grapes, not her green ones. But she'll also work for banana and apple, and they both will work for melon occasionally, all the sweet stuff. So they just get much bigger chunks as the reward than what they would get in their regular diet. So are any of the bat species endangered? Yes, yeah, so uh, a lot of bats all across the world are unfortunately endangered, partially because of like the wildlife trade, the wet market situation. A lot of our Ohio bats are becoming endangered because of white nose syndrome. And Corey is checking the actual full status of our bats here that we have at the zoo. So the Seba short tails are a species of least concern, so they're lucky. Um, the straw colors, these guys are near threat, so if people don't step in and help them pretty soon, they will become fully endangered. And the Rodriguez flying fox are endangered. They live on a little tiny island and there's not very many of them left. So, their ears are big, why is that? 
because they have really good hearing. So these, this, the fruit eating bats don't use echolocation. They don't need to, you know, their food doesn't run away. Fruit doesn't run away like bugs do. But they still have really good hearing. And if you notice, they're constantly moving. So they're constantly adjusting, listening where different sounds are coming from. So they just, they just like to listen. They're curious. Like I said, they're so smart. Um, bats are actually very closely related to primates. They're the most closest relation to primates um, that there is. So they're very, very smart animals. So they're constantly looking at their surroundings and trying to figure out what's going on. So since bats stay upside down most of the time, how does their digestive tract work? Um, that's a good question. I have to admit, I am not an anatomy expert, <laughs> but they do swallow and chew and everything upside down. So I'm guessing that they probably have some, you know, stronger valves at least in their stomach to keep the acid where it belongs, but I am not 100% sure about that, I'll be honest. That's a really good question. So would they ever go down and pick up all this food that oh, they're they dropping? Do. Yes, so that's a funny personality quirk between the two of them. Leon will not go down and pick up food off the floor. She, she's just not great at it. Sierra though, because she's so used to falling and then crawling wherever she wants to go, she will easily crawl down to the floor, grab whatever food she wants, and then take it back up to the top to eat it. She was doing that earlier while Corey was talking, and then Leon was like, ooh, look what you found on the floor. I'm gonna take that. So they were having a little bit of a spat over a piece of hair. But a lot of that that you see has to do with how they eat. So bats, they do eat the fruit, the pulp and stuff, but they really like the juice. So when they do eat, they tend to squish up all of the, the fruit and the pulp and suck the juice down, and then they spit the pulp out. I know I used to eat oranges like that when I was a kid, and I think a lot of people did. Well, the bats eat like that their entire life. So what you're seeing is a lot of that stuff that they don't want anymore because they got all the good juice out. All right, so as we wrap it up, what is something that people can do to help protect bats here in Ohio? So one of the things that you can do is, as Corey was saying, be careful if you do go into a known bat location, make sure you wash your shoes up and everything so you're not transmitting white nose syndrome back and forth between multiple locations. Another thing you can do, believe it or not, is to not get rid of our native insects. So don't spray your yard with chemicals, things like that, because that will poison the insects and then when the bats eat them, they can get poisoned from it. So doing things as simple as that, making sure that your hiking clothes and shoes and everything are clean when you go to different locations and not using poisonous pesticides when you're kind of treating your lawn. Yeah, it kind of, kind of sucks to have mosquitoes in your yard, but luckily they provide food for the bats. Now, Corey, can you think of anything else? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's good points. Uh, yeah, it's just for a lot of bats. Yeah. Okay, anything else? No. No? All right, well, hopefully you guys enjoyed meeting the bats. I love talking about them. Corey and I have that in common. Bats are some of our favorite animals to talk about. And I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, all right? Thank you guys very much.